He's about 455 yards away. He's going to hit about a two iron, I think. This is the School of Motion podcast. Come for the MoGraph, stay for the puns. I was very comfortable at this job. It was an awesome job because I was working with all my very best friends. I was respected. I was getting raises. They kept giving me more money. There were a lot of things about it that, that, that do sound dream jobish. But at the same time, I think comfort can also be really uninspiring in terms of making good work. In case you haven't noticed, I'm kind of a fan of freelancing. It's not for everyone, but I really think it's important for motion designers to at least be familiar with the concept of working for yourself. There's a lot of talk these days about the quote, gig economy, and motion design is so prevalent now that it's inevitable. There will be a growing need for freelancers for the foreseeable future. My guest today is a very talented freelancer who manages to get great gigs, do great work, juggle that work with being a dad of four kids, and he works pretty normal hours from his office in South Carolina, which is not exactly a hotbed of MoGraph work. How does he do it? Well, that's exactly what David Stanfield and I get into in this interview. We talk about the pros and cons of freelancing, plus some pretty tactical ways to get noticed and to get booked. Now, before we jump in, let's hear a quick message from one of our amazing School of Motion alumni. Hi, my name is Lily Baker. I live in London, United Kingdom, and I've taken animation bootcamp, character animation bootcamp, and design bootcamp with School of Motion. These courses genuinely launched my whole career into animation and motion graphics and illustration. School of Motion has literally taught me everything I know. I've been amazed that I've gone from being self-taught, messing around with Adobe, to actually being able to quit my job and start freelancing the next day and it's been a year and I haven't been out of work and I 100% owe that all to School of Motion. My name is Lily Baker and I'm a School of Motion graduate. Dave, it is so great to have you on the podcast, man. I can't wait to catch up. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, man. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. It's a huge honor. Really appreciate it. An honor. It's, stop it. So it let, let's start with this. Um, you know, you and I have, have talked before because we featured you as one of the one of the freelancers in the Freelance Manifesto. But I'd love for you to just kind of tell everybody how you got into motion design because it's kind of an interesting story. Okay, sure. Yeah, I don't think um, I don't think my route is too normal. But I, I'm very much self taught. Um, I didn't go to school for design or anything like that. I was an advertising major, kind of a fluff, a fluff thing at the school I, I went to. And um, there wasn't really much of an art program to speak of either. There was this little house that was like three miles away from everything else on campus. And you really had to want to get there. Uh, so I took every art class that was offered. But uh, luckily, at some point along the way, I um, kind of stumbled into an illustrator class, Adobe Illustrator. The professor was was really cool. It, it wasn't. Um, it, it was really just a class about learning the the software. Uh, there wasn't. It wasn't like a design course or an illustration course. I wouldn't say, but we went tool by tool down the toolbar and and just learned the ins and outs of Illustrator. Um, and through that, I kind of slowly found out that there was a thing called graphic design and. I was a junior in college, I guess, at this point. And so I got really into design. There was a musician called Tycho, but he he also had a sort of design alias that he went by called ISO 50, uh, like the film speed. And he he made these really colorful, really, um, to me, I'd never seen anything like it. They were really fresh, I guess, at the time. But these vector illustrations, basically. But he also brought in textures from Photoshop and had all these layers in his artwork. And so the art of ISO 50 along with his music, um, like kind of got me interested in design. And um, from there, I just kind of taught myself, you know, Photoshop and Illustrator more and more. And I would spend hours and hours in the in the Mac lab, uh, just learning Illustrator. And so, yeah, I I feel like I'm I'm rambling and going probably deeper than you wanted me to go with this. But um, oh, it's all good. Why don't we get into like, you know, what was your first sort of job in this industry? Like, what were you what was your role? uh, Yeah, my so my first job out of school, I did newspaper layout. (laughs) Um, And I got paid $10 an hour for my first year of school. Yeah, first year out of college. And I was 
I was sort of, uh, I was in Tennessee at the time waiting for my then fiance to graduate. She's a year younger. I thought it was amazing that I was uh, getting paid to, to design things. And looking back, like there's, there's nothing glamorous about that job at all. But um, I got paid to learn. And I feel like that's kind of been a theme in my sort of creative path so far is getting paid to learn, just getting good opportunities and trying to take advantage of those. Did you learn anything doing newspaper layout that ended up being helpful down the line? Like, are there any, anything, any principles that came out of that? Yeah, like a million probably. But the the hands-on stuff was, I was in InDesign, Adobe InDesign all day, every day for a year. So, you know, Photoshop and InDesign and that, again, uh, not too glamorous, but Every day I was essentially solving a puzzle because that's what newspaper layout is. You have uh, a very finite amount of space and a very uh, set number of words and imagery uh, and, you know, logos and things like that that have to be fit in to this defined space. And so it was really a crash course in how to design something efficiently, I guess, and and in page layout, which the next year uh, my wife and I uh, moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, and I got a job on a on a magazine that focused on like youth action sports, like surf, skate, snow. And it was me and basically two other guys, and we created a hundred plus page magazine. We wrote the articles, we shot the photography, we designed, we did all. I did all the layout. Me and my friend Eric, and we basically were responsible for every aspect of this thing. And um, so immediately, like. Learning InDesign was huge for that for that next job. And that job led to then getting to design show packages and blocks of programming and coming up with graphic packages for shows that I would then pass off to animators uh, because the parent company of this magazine was a TV network. So it kind of became a, a direct path over a number of years. This, this was over years, but it ended up eventually leading me to what they called broadcast design, which is, which is what we call motion design. So when you were working at this magazine doing layout, I mean, that's, to me, that's like pretty pure design. Yeah. You're given an empty page and you have to fill it. Uh, so when you, when you were doing that, like, did you have some deep background in design that allowed you to do that? Or was it like figure it out and, you know, and, and look at the internet for tutorials? Yeah, it was, it was kind of fake it till you make it figure it out. And I had also, towards the end of my time in college, I had been designing a lot of album art for bands, friends bands, and a little bit of like paid, I guess, freelance work. Um, I'm sure it was like, you know, 200 bucks or something. But I was I was doing more than just layout. I guess the cool thing about it being a youth sort of focused magazine is that we, and even action sports, kind of the culture of it is we got to have more fun with the design, I think, because of that. So I, I was not only doing like page layout, but I was also drawing things and scanning them in and like bringing in fabric and like scanning that in to use as texture in the backgrounds of things. And we were getting to like create art for some of these features in the, in the magazine. You know, we did, we did like DVD packaging for these Costa Rica surf trips and like uh, these skate tours. So it was kind of crash course in like multimedia design too, I guess, as well as kind of the puzzle that is layout um, all. Uh, so, you know, it was like typography and color theory and composition. It was just like, like I said, just kind of an awesome lab to learn in uh, with a lot of a lot of freedom. Were there any, you know, so to me, and, and I know to a lot of our students, especially who take our, our design class, you know, just composing the frame, just figuring out how big things should be, how, where they should be, how much space is between them. That's yeah. like one of the most difficult things. And if you're doing magazine layout, that's a humongous part of the task. Yeah. Were there any like tricks you learned or, or things that you just sort of over time noticed like, oh, if I leave more space than I think I need. It actually looks better. Like, are there any, anything you remember learning then? Yeah. I mean, there's so much, so much of that. I, I guess like, it's funny right around the time I was getting really into like grid systems and, um, kind of, kind of rules of layout is also the time I sort of discovered Vimeo, I guess, and started looking at motion graphics stuff. But yeah, it, it really was like, all of those things that you mentioned and also learning about branding and identity. We were designing logos for different 
uh, aspects of this company and different aspects of this magazine. And then that turned into getting absorbed by a, just a general creative department. And so we were learning or we were doing web design and part of that job that I really, really hated, but was probably really good for me with, with what you're asking about is I had to, um, I had to make all these different web banners is, is when like half a designer's job was making web banners for some reason. Right. But um, all these different sizes, but they all had to have the same content and, and all these, you know, some were vertical, some were horizontal, some were big, some were small, some were square. And, and now that like, it's funny, it, it directly translates into like making motion videos for Instagram, but they're also going to be 16 by nine for YouTube. And they're also going to be this other weird ratio for Snapchat or whatever. And I feel like all those things have like somehow helped me, <laughs> even if I didn't realize they were going to help me at the time because I hated making web banners. Yeah, it's really interesting that you say that though, because you're you're I don't know I, I I'll use the word journey, even though that kind of sounds pretentious. But like the the way that you got to where you are now, there was probably a lot of weird twists and turns that made no sense at the time. But in hindsight, it's like ah, there was a plan. Oh yeah, there was a plan all along. And I know that there was no plan, but um, but it's just interesting in hindsight how it seems that way. So you ended up doing, um, you know, you ended, you were a designer, it sounds like, way more of a designer than, than an animator. Oh, yeah. But now you do both. And, um, and I know that, you know, before you were freelance, you had a full-time job doing this. So you're, at least compared to most of the artists in this field that I meet, you're rare in that you got good at design first mm. and then learned how to, you know, make things move and tell a story that way. And I wonder yeah. if you've gotten any sense from just interacting with other people like, you know, are, are there's obvious advantages to learning that way, I think. But there, are there any disadvantages? Do you ever wish like you had more of a technical background instead of a design background before you got into this? Oh, yeah, man. I, I mean, I, I don't even know about. I guess, I guess you could say technical background, but animation, I mean, <laughs> I feel so just, I'm such a baby, just <laughs> kind of learning how to crawl with animation. And, you know, it's, it's at first I was thinking, golly, like After Effects, how am I going to learn this? It's such a deep ocean, even though a lot of it looked very familiar to me because I, I was pretty fluent in Photoshop and Illustrator and even like InDesign. So it, it kind of felt a little bit like home, but even still, even with that background with the software, it was like, golly, After Effects is such an ocean. But then it wasn't, I guess I've been doing this, uh, doing After Effects animation for like seven years now, but it wasn't until like two or three years in that I realized like, oh my gosh, like animation is the ocean. Right. Like, <laughs> After Effects is just like a drop in that, in that ocean. But, um, you know, After Effects is just like one tool or one portal, one one way of doing it, of getting there. But animation itself is like this incredibly daunting thing to me. And yeah, all the time, I wish I had, you know, maybe gone to school for animation or um, at least like at, s at some point along the way, just had more access to it or exposure to it. But, um, you know, I, you can't really control what order things happen in or <laughs> like you said there, there definitely wasn't a plan this is just kind of like where where I've gotten to because of my own interests and curiosities and what I enjoy doing so you know I'm, I'm doing my best to kind of learn that side of it with every project that I get and it's uh, you know I don't think I'll ever get there especially on on that side of it but I'm enjoying the hugeness of it I guess <laughs> do you have you ever uh, interacted with uh, Claudio Salas no I haven't I've never met Claudio I love his work he's 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 amazing dude and he's he's one of these guys that is like a really good designer and oh maybe even a better animator yeah and I, I really I, I'm amazed by people like him who, who kind of have both sides of it when I look at your work yeah. your animation is actually very good like you know I know you probably feel like oh I'm just a baby in this industry um, we're gonna link to uh, to David's uh, portfolio and, and his dribble and stuff like that so you can see what he what he does but it, it is clear to me though that like your work seems more design driven than animation driven and just as a side note to everybody listening, I think that that's kind of a superpower because good oh. design good design doesn't need a lot of animation, but bad design, you have to do something fancy or else it just doesn't, it's not interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, would you agree with that? I, 
I do tend to agree with that. I guess I'm pretty biased um, because that's the only way I know. But um, I mean, uh, it's funny. I think I heard on your podcast the other day, Zach Dixon, I think this was with talking with you. You asked him what, what would he look for in a hire, I think. And he was saying design first because it doesn't matter how um, how great the moves are and how fluid the animation is, if the composition is terrible, it's, it's just not going to be enough to save it. And I tend to agree with that. I mean, it's, it's hard because the design part is also something that I'll never arrive at. I mean, I, I can get on Vimeo for 10 seconds and realize how far I have to go just, just to, uh, just to get, get level with what I'm seeing on the screen. I mean, from a design standpoint or an animation standpoint. So it's, it's not like I've, I've got design figured out. Now I'm trying to figure out animation. I think they're both always happening at the same time, but uh, no matter, no matter how good I got at becoming an animator, um, I don't think it would matter too much if the frames weren't composed well and well thought out. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. So when you finally found yourself actually doing motion design, you were full time. So, what was a typical day like for you at your full time job? Oh yeah. Um, again, I, I guess I was really fortunate. They, I, I worked for. Um, well, I worked for and with my friends, which was the first thing. But um, my boss at the time was actually one of my best friends named Eric, and he and the guy that would become my boss, uh, a guy named Zach. They they both agreed and mutually, Eric sort of released me to Zach's department, which was the broadcast design side of the creative room that we were in. We we're all in this shared space, super super fun. But so Zach, uh, this this guy Zach became my new boss, and he let me switch over from print and web design to motion design with no change of pay, having used After Effects one time on a personal project that I made with a friend for one of those weird like video contest things. We made a commercial for Best Buy with these like dancing monsters in it. <laughs> and so my, it's kind of funny side note, my first ever After Effects, try, trying out After Effects was animating characters into a real footage environment that were like motion tracked to camera moves. <laughs> I was like way in over my head, like the worst yeah, right possible now. way to, to like start. And I didn't know it was like, I didn't know it was too much. I was just like, yeah, motion track. A couple of clicks, you know, how hard could it be? Yeah. So there's like these little dancing guys in, in this footage. But um, anyway, uh, they let me switch over without any change of pay. And um, it's funny to, to your question about design and, and, design first kind of thinking I remember Zach said like we can teach you we can teach you the software we can teach you after effects we can teach you animation but you in 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 his estimation I guess he, he said you already have a good eye and that's the part that we can't really train like that, that's the part that's a lot harder to teach so they took a chance on me and let me switch over to motion design and then your your question um the day-to-day -day stuff I was I was getting to um, sort of just play really with with learning this stuff, but they they'd have like a show package for this new show that the um, network was doing, and I would I would design um, you know like a ten second open, and I'd storyboard it out and present style frames to the producer of the show. They were basically the client, even though they were just another department in the company, and um, then I would get to animate the stuff that I designed. And it was really like perfect training ground for doing client work. Um, Cause it, it basically was client work. They were just internal clients. So I would do those. And a lot of it was, you know, designing logos for these shows or for blocks of content. Um, I actually got to rebrand the entire network. Um, they, we all, uh, a bunch of us designed different takes on logos and, um, they ended up choosing one that I had designed. So I sort of became the unofficial lead of the project. And it, it was a crash course in learning how to apply a brand identity across all forms of, you know, content like uh, print design and web design and motion design and uh, on-screen bugs. And how, how does the logo animate in this situation, versioning things? I mean, it was like, yeah, just get, getting paid to learn is, is really the best way to describe it. So you're, what you're describing is probably to a lot of people, a dream job. 
you know, <laughs> you're, you, you get hired at your old salary without knowing After Effects and then you get to play around and then you kind of luck your way into leading an uh, entire network rebrand. Yeah. Along the way, you're getting better at After Effects and you're paid yeah. more. Um, so why in the world <laughs> did you go freelance? <laughs> why did you leave that? Yeah, that's valid. Um, <laughs> Well, there, there were also a lot of things I'm leaving out that were not very dream jobish about it that had more to do with politics and um, the place the, the place itself. Uh, but by and large, um, I just became, man, like increasingly more and more dissatisfied with how I was spending my time, my, my lifetime. I was just becoming kind of... Um, I don't know, apathetic. And I was very comfortable at this job. It was an awesome job because I was working with all my very best friends. I was respected. I was getting raises. Um, they kept like giving me more money. And <laughs> it, it, there were a lot of things about it that, that did sound or that do sound dream jobish. But at the same time, um, I think comfort can also be really uninspiring in terms of, uh, making good work. And I was very comfortable. I also was having kids. And after we had our second, my son, um, I was just getting really um, just over it, man. Like I, I was, I was driving 45, 55 minutes each way. So, you know, about two hours of every day spent in the car. And it was just, I was starting to realize that the way I was spending time wasn't um, what I wanted. And it also was working towards someone else's thing. And this thing that I was working toward, like someone else's vision, this was their project. You know, this was their freelance once upon a time. And now I'm just like this like cog in, in the wheel of that. And I don't really care about it at all. I love working with my friends. I love getting paid to learn all those things. But like the big picture stuff, I just wasn't into it. I wasn't invested in any way personally. And that started wearing on me more and more and more until it kind of became like the only thing I was thinking about when I was at work. I also just on a more practical level was getting tired of making lower thirds and like bumpers to commercials. I was ready to um, tell stories and to use music and sound and all those things. I, I was music used to be a huge part of my life and something I thought I was going to do like full time at one point. And I miss that. And, uh, you know, you don't really get to, you don't really get to use music that much when you're, you know, making posters or on the motion design side, making lower thirds and show, uh, show block show packages, you know? So on the practical side, I, I had this, I had this goal, this in, in 2014, I will, and you fill in the blank. It's something I found online. This, this, this guy had come up with this thing. And, uh, it was supposed to motivate you to go after one thing specifically. And I had written in 2014, this is when I was still full-time employed. I will, and I wrote make six explainer videos, which <laughs> sounds really funny to me now. Um, that's not what I, that's not what I expected. Yeah. You to say. <laughs> well, that's, it goes to show you where, how, just how much of a plan this all wasn't. Um, but I, that was like, to me, I, so I'd gotten to do like two little like explainer type videos. And I was like, man, this, on a, on a freelance basis. And I was like, this is incredible. I'm, I'm like, all he did was give me a script and a music track and a VO. And then I do everything else. And I get to like decide everything about how this story gets told this is amazing. I just want to make these. <laughs> and um, yeah. now the whole term explainer video kind of, kind of makes me a little nauseated. But uh, at the time, like that was my goal was um, I just, if I could just make six of these in 2014 on the side while I'm at my job, I think I would be happy enough to like, you know, let, let my day job sort of fund this, this, this more fun thing at night or whatever. But then, uh, freelance work picked up more and more and more. And in, in, in March of 2014, I decided I was going to go freelance and I crossed out, you know, make six explainer videos and wrote go freelance in a Sharpie way bigger than I had written the first thing. And yeah. Sharpie it's permanent. You know, now you have to, yeah. yeah, no more, no more pencil, no more explainer videos, but yeah. So you, you, you said a whole bunch of things there. I kind of want to point out. Um, yeah, sorry, and, I'm like, and, and, 
Oh no, I mean that was that was a good ramble. There was like some wisdom in there. So uh, uh, everyone listening, just so you know, um, David is is one of the artists that we featured in the freelance manifesto, which is if you go to schoolmotion.com, you can find it. It's also on Amazon. Um, and and one of the reasons I wanted to feature David is because uh, his experience leaving his full-time job, it really reminded me of mine. And I think you were doing it for a lot of the same reasons. It has nothing to do with like not liking your boss, not liking your coworkers, not getting paid enough. Although I imagine now freelancing, you probably make a lot more than you did on staff. Um, but you said something that I have, I have a feeling this is going to be the quote that opens this episode. Comfort can be really uninspiring. Mm. And I don't know if everybody's built that way. I am certainly built that way. If I don't feel at least a little bit nervous about what I'm doing at all times, <laughs> I can't sustain that for very long. And, and it's it's driven me in a lot of very strange strange places. You also mentioned that that being there every day, two hour commute, <laughs> you know, yeah. back and forth, and you have children, it starts to eat away at you, and you start to question your own like you know, these personal choices you're making, I'm choosing to spend yeah. 10 hours a week yeah, why am I in a car. This? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's kind of amazing. Um, and then, the, and then another big thing, the work you were doing doesn't sound awful, but you had no choice. You, you had to do what was put in front of you. Yeah. Um, and now you have the choice. So, so obviously those are like, so three of the biggest reasons that people think about freelancing. So now you're freelance. Um, what does a typical day look like right now? In a minute, I want to get back to what it was like when you started freelancing. Okay. But right now, what does David's day look like? Man, that's probably a pretty boring answer. I Every morning, I take my oldest two to school. They're both in full-time school for the first time ever. I have a little office that's less than a minute drive, which um, was the reason I wanted this little office. Um, it's less less than a minute drive from my kid's school. So I drop them off at about eight o'clock and then I work really, really normal hours from usually eight to five, basically. And that's kind of it. I mean, when I'm one of the biggest differences of being freelance is now like when I'm working, like I'm working. I I, at, at the job I was at, a lot of our time was spent just being there because we had to be, you know, I'd finish something and be waiting for a response or whatever. And it'd be 3 p.m. And instead of going to hang out with my kids or, um, I don't know, do anything else, uh, I had to just keep sitting in the chair because it wasn't five o'clock yet. And as a result, a lot of the time was spent sort of, uh, goofing off and, and having fun with friends, which I think is awesome and probably made our work better. So I'm not, I'm not discrediting that. I think it's great. But now um, time is much more valuable. So on a typical day, I work from eight to five. And for most of <laughs> most every hour of that time, I am actively uh, doing some form of work. Yeah. When you, when you become a parent, I think time speeds up. Yeah. It seems to, well, it, it sometimes it actually slows down, but <laughs> yeah, two in the morning when the baby won't right, crying. Right. But, but overall, like it, it speeds up. And I think when you're, you know, when you're 24 and you, you don't have a family and your rent's really low, then yeah, it's fun to be at the studio hanging out with your friends, even right. though like you're not really being productive. You know, but then when you're 30 and you got kids at home and and you want to kind of want to go hang out with them and you're just sitting there thinking, this is time I'll never get back. Yeah. So I think I don't think that you can kind of say one way or the other, like sitting there in the studio, wasting time with your buddies is bad or good. It just depends on the phase of, of life you're in. Do you think like, did you start to have that sense that like I'm entering a new phase and this just no longer fits? Yeah, I think so. I don't know if I thought about it in those terms at, at the time. Um, I certainly do now having four kids. Dear God. I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, that too. <laughs> it's like that Jim Gaffigan quote. I think he said it when he had five kids, but he's like, having another kid is like you're drowning and then someone throws you a baby, <laughs> which is like more accurate than I even care to, to think about. Um, I know. it's <laughs> But yeah. Yeah, I, I think kids too like have a have a funny way of 
t- time is always, I guess, a currency, but you don't think of it that way. Like you said, when you're younger and, and you have a lot of it to spend. Um, I have very little of my own time now. Like my, my me time is spent, uh, you know, driving home from the office every day for, for 10 minutes. And that's, you know, by the time the kids are in bed and the house is quiet, my wife and I both just kind of collapse on the couch at 9 p.m. or whatever time it is when, when we've gotten all the waters and done all the songs and <laughs> all of those things. Um, and so, yeah, like I don't, I don't really have after hours to, um, to just like work on my own stuff or, uh, you know, all, all the things I see people talking about online. Um, gosh, I'm doing it again, man. I'm going off on a total rabbit trail. But yes, time is made into a very valuable currency when you have a kid um, when you have two or more, that just goes into like overdrive yeah. real, real fast. Yeah. And this is totally, totally off. This is totally off topic, but everyone with kids can probably commiserate. Like, you know, what, when you don't have kids, um, there, it's funny how there is time. There's lots of time, but it, actually now having, th- I have three kids and, and to me, I see my friends who don't have any kids yet. And I'm like, you have infinity time right? Um, because you, you, you mentioned bedtime being like, you know, it's kind of this all out assault and that's how it yeah. feels for us too. It's like from start to finish, it takes at least an hour and there's usually at least one kid that really doesn't want to go down and you oh, got to, yeah. there's always a straggler. You got to run the gauntlet. Yeah. 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 Like a hostage <laughs> negotiation. So, all right. So, so you work essentially eight to five, yeah. which, which I think a lot, you know, and you live a minute from your house, which by the way, I have to say like that, that's exactly how, I mean, a minute from your office. That's how, when we moved uh, from Massachusetts to Florida on purpose, I, I, cause I was in the same situation up in Massachusetts, a three hour commute for me. Cause I had to take a train. Um, I said, I will never commute again. And so I, our office, uh, school of motions office is about you know, a 15 minute bike ride from our house. Um, so it's, it's fantastic. That is amazing. I, I have to correct you a little bit. I'm actually, we live across the bridge now in Charleston, uh, on, on James Island. So I'm actually like a 15 minute drive fr- from home to work. Uh, but I'm, I'm really close to my kid's school. So it all, it works out nice when we, when we first moved to Charleston, which side note is something else that was only possible because of freelance. So I'm grateful for that. But um, when we first moved here, we lived downtown and I worked downtown and I could ride my bike to work and I miss that so much. So I'm very yeah. jealous of your, uh, your 15 minute bike ride. It's such a simple thing. It's weird. Like riding your bike to work versus Huge. being in a, th- it, it seems like such a small thing, but when you start doing it, you realize, I don't know, there, there, there's something about just being outside with air on you for 15 minutes that oh, you get to work and you're in a completely different mindset. We should, I, I want to do a whole episode on, on this kind of stuff too. I also meditate. <laughs> I completely agree. Yeah. It's built into your day too. You don't even have to make it happen. It's just, it's like it's automatic, you know, lose a couple, lose, lose, you, you work on that dad bod, you know, you don't want to <laughs> <laughs> oh, a few man. calories. So you, so you work from eight to five and, and you, you said when you're working, you are working, you're focused. Now, Obviously, that means you are booked and you're busy and you've got a lot of work. But when you started, I'm assuming that you didn't just start off instantly like booked every single day or maybe you did. What was it? What was it like at first? How did you get those first few freelance gigs? Like, did you have a great reel? Like, how how did it work at the beginning? No, (laughs) I definitely didn't have a great reel. Um, So, yeah, it's kind of funny, man. I, I, the first, um, the job that sort of was like the straw that broke the camel's back. And I was like, all right, I'm going to quit my day job. This is, this is it. We're doing this. Like it was this job, um, that was going to pay, uh, not, not a whole lot, uh, looking back, but to me it was a lot. And it was about the equivalent of a month of my salary. And it was enough work that I couldn't, I couldn't take it on if I stayed at my job. So it was like, all right, uh, I'd already been saving up living expenses. And I had like, my goal was to get to six months of living expenses. I think I had like four. So I was close. And then this job came in I was like, all right, this is it. It's time. I'm going to take this on. So, uh, you know, it's a whole, whole other story, but after a lot of deliberation and, and talking and all that stuff with my wife, I quit my job. And then the job, uh, the freelance job got pushed like two and a half weeks. <laughs> Classic. I was going to take like three or four days off like kind of get, get myself, get myself ready, you know? 
and, uh, and then start. And then the job got pushed off and I was terrified. Like now looking back, like I, I know that that just happens all the time. Like that's more the rule than the exception for a job to not follow the schedule that you were originally told. But at the time I was like, Oh God, like we're screwed. Like I, I, this job's not even going to happen anymore. We don't have any money. I just quit my job. Like, and so I worked on my logo, my personal <laughs> logo for like a week and a half and animated it because I wanted to practice and I needed something to do. And then the job started and it went horribly. Like it was awful. It wasn't stuff that I was even like good at. It was the way the files were set up was like terrible. And it it just, it just wasn't a good experience at all. And I was like, man, what have I done? Oops. Um, So that was how it started out for me. Uh, Dream, dream scenario. So in the beginning, (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry to hear that, man. (laughs) That's That's awful. Uh, so, Real so I, you, you told me, um, when we talked for the freelance manifesto that in the beginning, you know, it was, it was difficult for you and you reached out to a few kind of industry superstars for advice. Can you talk about that? Like wh- who did you reach out to? Yeah, it was actually when I was still at my full-time job, I think I was just trying to like, I don't know, man, I was, I was like reading everything I could possibly read about going freelance and about like embracing risk and, you know, all these inspirational sure. um, like blog posts and, and they, and they were like huge for me. Cause I was like, yeah, this is where I'm at. And, uh, part of that at, at my job, I think I even did it while I was at work, which is probably something you shouldn't do. But, um, I emailed a guy named Bram Darty Johnson. Um, I'd seen his work here and there and, and thought it was really cool. Um, and then I also reached out to, uh, Jordan Scott, who I'm sure nobody's ever heard of. Um, right. and, uh, probably, Oh, um, Michael Jones, who's, I guess maybe I shouldn't talk about him to you because he's like your, he's in your same marketplace. He's your, he's your competition. I, actually, you can, we can definitely talk. I'm actually talking to Michael an hour after I get off the podcast with you. Oh, yeah. cool. He's coming on the podcast. Yeah. No, Michael and I have a great relationship. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, I, he's a guy that, um, had actually kind of thrown some work my way when I was still employed and some of those early explainer videos I was talking about was a direct result of him throwing some work my way. And he, um, he had posted this talk called the business of motion design that he gave at like a motion meetup in Atlanta. And he like showed, um, what he was making and he talked about the business side of it and how he hasn't experienced feast or famine. He hasn't experienced boom and bust. And, um, I don't know, man, that really inspired me. I was like, man, maybe I could actually do this and maybe I could actually like provide for my family and this could actually work and be more lucrative than, uh, certainly than like print design would have been for me. Cause I just didn't see a way to, to make as much money that way. And then I reached out to those two guys I mentioned, uh, Bran and Jordan Scott, and they both got back to me and like, I remember Bran wrote me this like long email about his experience, like working in studios and why he's freelance and completely, completely different from my story, but super helpful and uh, inspiring and, and just informative too. And he was so relatable and down to earth. And Jordan Scott, I think he had like just moved across the country. I can't remember if it was to the West coast or the East coast or what, but he took time out. Um, there were like boxes behind him and we FaceTimed and the Google Hangout like dropped and didn't work. So we had to try another thing or then we had to try FaceTime. And he, he just, um, you know, answered what were probably pretty naive questions. Cause I, I literally didn't know anything about this industry at all. Like I've just been sitting in a room making lower thirds and show packages, you know, in Charlotte, but he answered my questions honestly and patiently. And yeah, man, I don't know. Uh, another guy is Jorge, uh, Canest. He, um, he was like the whole reason I got into motion graphics. I should probably mention. <laughs> Never heard of him. Yeah. Who's that guy? <laughs> He's okay. But his, his work, like all those early videos that everyone freaked out about that Jorge made that sort of started to define what motion design is. <laughs> um, he, that stuff made me want to take stuff that I made an illustrator and make it move around like, big time. And so I like my first couple reels I sent to him <laughs> and uh asked him to critique them and he totally did. He was like, "Yeah, 
this was cool. This over here, not, not so cool. Maybe you should not put stuff that you made from tutorials in. And it was just like all these guys that I thought were like mammoth figures to me, as we all know, they're just people just like everyone, whether it's a big client or, you know, a, a producer at some huge agency. Like once you talk to them on the phone for a kickoff call, it's like, Oh, they're humans. Cool. Um, and it was the same, same way with these guys. Like I was so intimidated and they were just so like, Oh yeah, love to chat, whatever, you know? And, um, that was, that was really huge for me in, in kind of thinking that maybe I could go for it and do this. So that's one of the best things about our industry for sure. Like there's not, there's not many people out there that, you know, don't want you to succeed so that they can succeed more. It doesn't, yeah, yeah. it doesn't work that way. Um, you know, it's funny. It, it's funny. You, you mentioned Michael Jones and then you felt bad because we're technically competitors. We, we don't really treat each other that way. We recommend each other's courses to our students and, and, and all of that stuff because, um, and it's the same with, you know, me and Christo and, and, and me and Nick. I mean, we, you know, and, and especially when you get to the level of like freelancers, because, you know, Michael Jones used to be a freelancer and he's rec- he's get, he's passing work to you that yeah. may never come back to him because maybe they like you better for, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, but, but once you get out into the industry and you're freelancing and you, and you kind of learn some tricks, maybe you read the freelance manifesto. There's <laughs> always, there's always work. There's, and, and I think there's more and more. So, you know, freelancing now versus when you started, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously you know what you're doing and you've got some clients that you've worked with that are probably coming back to you. Um, but have you noticed any trends? Do there seem to be more clients, less clients? Uh, is it easier, harder to get work? I don't know across the board. I, I can speak to, I guess, my experience. I have, have been pretty constantly busy since I started and that's huge. I'm, I'm very, very thankful to be able to say that. I think now is a really, really good time to do what we do just because for better or worse, everyone has a screen in front of their face at all times and it's just more and more true. But yeah, man, I think think for me, a lot of it has to do with just really trying hard to be good to work with and really um, considering every project as an opportunity to learn. And it sounds cheesy, but like, doing the best possible job that I can with even the smallest opportunities at the beginning, I think led to some things in my career that caused me to get lots of work after that. An example of that, actually going back to the e- e- reaching out to people in your industry thing, uh, Bran Darty Johnson passed my name on to a guy named Joe Posner at Vox. And I don't know if he was at the time or, or what, but he, he's, he's the head of all video at Vox, Vox News not Fox News, but Fox News. Um, very different. And very <laughs> slightly, yeah. But um, but Brand passed my name on to the director of video at Vox, uh, a guy named Joe, and he was awesome. And I did these four explainer videos. And from those, man, I tried as hard as I could on those. I, I really did. Like, tried to make them the best that I possibly knew how. And, um, you know, they're, they're, they weren't the best things then, and they're certainly not the best things now. But... I think I also tried to be very pleasant to work with and um, tried to communicate well and clearly. And through those, I got a project doing design and motion for a series of interviews with President Obama at the time. And um, those uh, really, really led to a lot more work for me. And I've had a lot of emails that reference those directly, um, that, that Obama project specifically. And so... You know, I, th- I think it was just a good example of like taking a relatively small opportunity and um, not taking it lightly, I guess, and and trying to do the best work you can and use it as an excuse to learn and get better. Well, it sounds like you're fortunate in that you don't have to do a, a ton of, I guess, new client development or outreach. You know, and and I, you know, I notice you're very active on social media. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and I, I'm curious, like, how has that helped you get work and helped your career? Man, it's funny. I always feel like a little funny talking about this stuff because it sounds so stupid. But um, (laughs) when people ask me like, how do you get work? How do you get clients? It's like, I'm always like, ah, you know, 
Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, Vimeo. Um, but no, I've, I have, I think, uh, I'm going to start to sound like a jaded freelancer now. I'm, I'm getting more and more exhausted by keeping up with all of that stuff. Um, it's, it, it's hard to do the self promotion thing all the time, but I also have four kids that are always there when I get home. And so I have a constant reminder of how much about me this isn't. So I'm, I'm fine with sharing work because it's actually tangibly gotten me, gotten me work doing that and trying to stay in front of people, I guess. And, you know, keeping, keeping your, your social media stuff like fresh or whatever. But, um, I don't know, man, like Twitter has been huge because it's not just about like getting work. It's like the community there is, is really cool. And I can ask a question about some like, you know, minute detail of after effects. And within five minutes, I'll have five really good answers from people who just like want to help. And then I'll retweet those if I think it's like something that someone else could benefit from. And so there's like the community aspect too, uh, as well. And like, even that goes back to what you're talking about with Michael Jones and school of motion and MoGraph mentors. Like there's the scarcity mentality where you want to hoard things and you're like, these are my secrets. These are, this is the way I work. I don't want anyone else to know about this. Or there's the abundance mentality, which is where I tend to try to try to live is there's enough for everyone and kind of like the, 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 the rising tide raises all boats kind of way of thinking. And I've seen that come back to me in my career. I'm sure there's people out there that have taken on more of the hoarding mentality who have done just fine. Also, uh, maybe they both work, but, um, with, with the online community, I've seen that to be true, even with getting client work from Twitter. So, um, uh, an example of that literally just happened last month where, there's a guy named Sam Harris and he has like, I don't know, uh, I could pull it up like 950,000 followers on Twitter. And he literally asked, Hey, I'm making a, I want to make an animated video. Does anyone know of anyone? And someone tagged me in it, which was nice. And I saw it. And then I saw how many followers he had. And I was like, ah, oh, well, I'll never hear from that guy. Right. <laughs> He's got like a million followers. And then like three weeks or so went by and then he emailed me and I, I just, wrapped up a project for this app that he's making but that was oh i'm jealous i'm actually a big sam harris fan oh yeah i I love his podcast yeah he's a very interesting guy he is very interesting and he's very very intelligent and this this is a i don't well actually i don't know when it's going to release but it's called waking up and it's a an app so i'll just i'll just leave it at that but um Cool. And it's a, it's a book too, that is actually out. Um, it's that's really right. pretty, it's pretty fascinating. It's very woo woo, but, um, he's, <laughs> he's a genius. I think that's fair to say. Yeah. Very, very smart guy. But that was a job that I literally got because of Twitter. Not all of them are that direct. I think sometimes things kind of like meander their way to you over the course of months, um, because of social media, but this was like a, you know, a very direct example of that. So yeah. How about Dribble? Because you have a, you have a ton of stuff on Dribble, and I know that that's become oh, yeah. very popular. Um, if you go currently, if you go to Dribble's homepage and you go to like their about page, Lynn Fritz is is like their featured uh, yeah. artist. Yeah. So um, so has has that helped you? I like Lynn Fritz a lot. I've, I've oh, she's met amazing. Her, like three different times at different places in the world. <laughs> um, Super cool. Yeah, Dribble is cool, but I always forget about it. Like. I'm embarrassed that we're talking about it because I haven't posted to it in like at least two months. I need to, I need to do better with dribble, but also um, I, I do think it's cool that they added gifts a while back and they're, it seems like they're trying to like do the motion design thing a little bit more justice. But um, man, Instagram is like, it used to be if you wanted to feel really crappy about yourself and your work, you'd go on Vimeo and go to wine after coffee and be like, ah, I suck. But now it's just so much easier to feel crappy about yourself because you can go on Instagram and it's more efficient. That's it's good. <laughs> so much more efficient loss of self-esteem. But you, yeah, it seems like every studio, every freelancer, every everybody is posting little project clips and snippets on Instagram, which is really fun because you get to get to go and see all the, the eye candy. But I think I used to I used to feel a little bit annoyed that all this stuff was there and like you had to kind of like be on it and stuff. But I think I've tried to kind of shift my my perspective on it. And I just think of it as an extension of my own website. And it's, it's not really any different than posting work to your site, which is kind of an exciting thing, at least for me. Like I love that feeling of finishing a project and being able to like put it somewhere 
even even just for nothing else to to know that it's done. <laughs> yeah. But now like there's just different portals of sharing and viewing work and I think Instagram in particular seems pretty pretty uniquely suited for that cuz you can you can share uh, 10 seconds or you can share a minute, which is kind of crazy. So for most of the projects that guys like me tackle, you could you could kind of share like the whole project on there if you really wanted to. But um, I Yeah, I've heard, I've heard a lot of people say Instagram's kind of the, you know, Instagram and Dribble seem to be the two big ones right now um, in terms of social media. I feel like yeah. I almost feel old talking about Twitter because Twitter's like, mm. it's old, right? Like, yeah. It's ancient in social media years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not it's not where the kids are hanging out anymore, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> Soon you're going to need like a Snapchat and a, oh, God. I don't know. So, all right. So let's talk about the, the freelancing thing some more. So are you at the point where you're scaling yourself at all. Do you ever take on two jobs and book a freelancer that you kind of manage or are you still basically doing it all yourself? Okay. So this, this is going to show you just how naive I was when I first went into this. I pretty much from the get go was regularly juggling projects and taking on more than just one thing. And, and the reason for that wasn't always intentional. It's just that schedules would flex and things would kind of like change. Um, delivery dates would get pushed off because of the client taking forever to respond or start dates would get pushed off because they weren't quite ready yet. It was never like I would line everything up on paper on my calendar and be like, okay, this job's going to wrap up here and I'm going to start on this job next. Woohoo. And then it inevitably never went that way. And um, I didn't even realize it until a couple years in, but basically what I was doing was functioning as a very small studio and not as a quote unquote freelancer. And I didn't know that because I didn't know that going into a studio for a day rate was even a thing. Like literally didn't know that people did that stuff. Uh, I've always been remote. Like I, I lived in Charlotte up until three years ago, we moved to Charleston, but you know, not exactly huge markets for, for motion design. Or, sure. or any kind of video production or anything like that. So all the work I've done has always been remote. I've never done the like go into a studio and sit there thing. And so I didn't even know people would ask me for a day rate and I would give them one if they really wanted it. But I've always preferred working per project, like a per project quote. And um, I think the reason for that is like the whole reason I wanted to go freelance on the on the work side of things was I didn't. I didn't want to be like babysat. I didn't want to be not trusted. I wanted to, I wanted to be entrusted with a project and then be, be expected to do it well, you know? And so um, the day rate kind of setup always felt like I was more of just like an employee, which is kind of what I had just decided to leave. And so I'd always done like per project rates. And again, I, I didn't even know I was sort of operating like a studio, but that has tended to be the way that I've done things. Now, as, a, as I've kind of gone on and gotten a little bit bigger opportunities, there have been plenty of projects where I was doing a day rate and that was the only thing I was working on. And that happens too, which is, which is great. But um, by and large, I, I tend to, um, I've tended to operate more like a little, a little teeny tiny studio of one person. Do you ever bring on like, you know, another animator or, you know, even a producer to help do stuff or is it always just you? Producer would be so, so great. I, I, <laughs> I wish I, every time I think about that, I get really confused because I'm like, well, how do you even like catch them up to speed? And like, how do they, you know, I'd, I'd love to do that. But yes, I do bring on other animators more and more lately. And it's something that I'm actually like more and more enjoying. Um, I have a really good friend named Josh. Josh Hollers. And um, funny enough, he's one of the guys that taught me After Effects at my full-time job in Charlotte. And um, he he quit that job and went and like traveled the world for a while and then came back and now he's freelance. And so I use Josh whenever I possibly can because he's the man and he's my buddy. So that's awesome. And then um, actually a, a, huge, a huge thing that I'd love to talk about is beginning to collaborate more and more with um, another friend named Matt and Matt Smithson. He he's known as Man vs. Magnet on the uh, on the internets, mm -hmm. but amazingly talented animator, fine fine art background. We're actually collaborating more and more, and going to be starting something up that I'm really excited about. So I don't know if you want to. We can talk about that now. Or I would love to dig into that a little, a little bit because I was going to ask you. I mean, a lot of I've talked to a ton of people that go freelance and, 
you know, maybe they have a bumpy star, but it ends up working out. And then they're like, I am going to freelance forever. This is amazing. And I was going to ask, do you feel that way? Because you've been doing it for a few years and now you're, you're talking about getting bigger opportunities and collaborating. Do you think that you'll stay, quote, freelance or are you, you starting to, you know, see a, a way to do this differently as a group and not just as David? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good, good way to put it. Yeah. I do feel in terms of being on my own, like self-employed, I, I, I started to feel pretty unhirable at this point. I'm so it's a great word. happy to be doing things the way that I'm doing them. And I've, I don't know, man, not to sound whatever. I, I've turned down some pretty big opportunities for job offers. And when I did that, it, it kind of was like, okay, this is where the rubber meets the road. Like if I'm turning this down, I better be serious about this. And I guess I'm really saying like, yes, I'm putting all my chips in the center of the table. And I'm, I'm, I'm in this for real because I just turned this down over here. And this is something that this is a type of job offer that you just don't turn down. Like, unless you're an idiot. Right. <laughs> so either I'm an idiot or I really like being freelance um, <laughs> or both. But yeah, man, it's, it's, it's been good and I love it. And I feel it would be very hard for me to go back to a, a job where I'm expected to show up at this and that time and um, expected to go to this and that meeting. And I, I've really just, just loved it. Um, but on the flip side, what I haven't loved and I'm increasingly realizing is that I, I'm tired of being a lone wolf in this. Um, mm -hmm. I'm tired of being inside my own head all the time, you know, particularly at the beginnings of projects, right? Where you're storyboarding and coming up with concepts and figuring out how you're actually going to tell the story that's in the script. I'm tired of like it just being me and being alone in that and sort of carrying that both in terms of like the burden of it, but also in terms of like, I'm sick of just having to go with my, my ideas. <laughs> I'm ready to like let someone else in on that and collaborate on that. And so i um, crazy, crazy excited about working with Matt. We, um, we actually met at blend in Vancouver when I met you and he used to live in Charleston. And about the time that I was coming here, he was moving away. And so we never met here, but then we met in Canada, which is random the way it happens. That's, that's as most, as most people do. Yeah. You meet in Vancouver. Um, so second, second time I need to say thank you to Jorge for, um, making blend a thing that happens in the world because it allowed me to meet Matt and his wife, Katie and them and me and my wife really hit it off. And, um, we just kind of had this ongoing conversation about sort of being tired of working alone. And Matt's been doing this for a lot longer than I have. And, one day, I guess like maybe six months ago or something, I was I was just kind of burned out. I had just finished this long stretch of work. I had worked long hours and, you know, my my brain was mashed potatoes and I was driving home and I just randomly texted Matt. I used I used Siri to text him. Don't worry, I did, I did not type into my I was, I was <laughs> my eyes were on the road. Damn. But I said, Hey Siri, text Matt Smithson. And then fifteen minutes later she was like, What do you want to say? And I said Hey man, let's just collaborate on a project and see how it goes. I would love to work with you. And he wrote back and was like, man, it's funny. I was just telling my wife, I'd really love to do some work with David. And so it was cool. We, we kind of started from this place of like mutual respect and we both admired each other's work and we already knew we got along IRL as the kids say. Oh boy. <laughs> in, in real, in real life. But we already knew we, we got along well, which is important. And we, sort of trust each other, like on a personal level, I guess. And so, man, we, um, we, we collaborated actually on that, on that Sam Harris project that I was telling you about. And that was a, I guess, a couple of three months ago, something like that. And while we were doing that one, another job came in. And while we were doing that one, another job came in. And then all of a sudden we were working on five or six things and sharing the burden on all of it. And we were super stressed out and it was crazy, but we were also both really enjoying the fact that we were doing it together. And so um, we we're actually launching a thing and I think it'll be, the goal is that it'll, it'll already be out in the wild by the time anyone hears this podcast, but it's, we're going to be calling it uh, Igor and Valentine. And it's going to be a design and animation collaboration between Matt and I. So yeah, I'm very, very. Dude, that's, that. that's a really exciting news. And there's a, 
there's kind of this new model sort of spinning up because of how easy it is to collaborate remotely. And most clients don't really care where you are now, yeah, yeah. you know, as long as you can sort of get it done on time and they like it. And, and you're able to form these sort of pseudo studios, I guess, Yeah, yeah. you know, essentially a two person studio that doesn't have the overhead of a big office and, right. you know, employees and, and things like that. Um, and, and it, you know, it's, it's great. I've talked to a few people that are, that are starting to work that way. Mm. And I, I have a feeling you're going to be super successful with that. Can't wait to see what happens. Um, the last thing I want to ask you about is how you managed to do all of this with four children, <laughs> you know, like, so for, let me ask you this first. Do you think that, being freelance makes it easier to be the father you want to be? Do you think it's you would be sacrificing if you were full-time? I do. Real, real answer is it's been very, very, very hard. And I think that's a function of a lot of things in my life happening at once, meaning having two additional kids, starting a business, moving to a new city, moving houses three times, changing schools for my oldest, my daughter, you know, all of these uh, buying houses, selling houses, these big life things, you usually do them one at a time. So uh, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a little unique in that my answer involves more than just running a freelance business and having four kids. It's like there's there's all these other things that happen at the same time. So it's, it's just, it's been kind of crazy in general. But I also know for a fact that I have been way more in control of how I spend my time. I've had probably three or four different phases in the last year where I took on entirely too much. I got super burned out and I worked long hours and I felt kind of crazy. <laughs> but the difference is that was my choice. My wife supported it and she knew about it going in. You know, we have these sit down talks where I say, all right, babe, this, this, and this, they're going to overlap. It's going to be crazy for a couple weeks. We'll, we'll, we'll get will get paid this much as a result, but it is going to get kind of nuts for a second. And if I get her blessing on that, I move forward. If I feel like I can do the work and do a good job, obviously, and not betray any client trust or anything like that, always, always notify the client. I do have this going on. This is going to be something I take on on top of it. This might be a nights and weekend kind of thing. Are you okay with that? And I've never had anyone take issue with that. So that that's a huge part of it is my wife knows about it and is very, very supportive of me and like helps me. And so the, but the difference again, is like, I've, I've chosen those times of insanity and it's a choice that I, um, I made and like, I wanted to do this because the, the projects, the type of projects that they were. And then when they're done, I get to take a break and I get to choose when I take a break. So, you know, I just wrapped up one of the craziest months in my career, October, but even in October, I went to like four different things at my kid's school because it's around the corner and I knew that I could just like maybe work an hour later that night um, or come in an hour earlier the next day and make up for it. And those kinds of things like just aren't really always an option at a job job. Or if they are, you have to like give two weeks notice on the, on the, on the department calendar or whatever, you know, like I'm sure there are plenty of jobs that are super, super chill about family stuff and that's rad. But um, for me, it's just like the knowledge of being in control of my time. So I decide when it's going to be insane. And then I decide when and how I'm going to take a break after that kind of insane push. So I'm not saying it's always easy. And there, there have also been other challenges with, with staying kind of busy, just creatively speaking. But, but, the, but the difference for me of kind of being my own boss or whatever you want to call it is I am the one who's calling the shots and making the decisions. David is one of the nicest people I've met in an industry full of nice people. Seriously, there's not that many jerks in MoGraph. It's pretty awesome. Check out the show notes to see David's work and the work of all the other artists that we chatted about. And if you haven't already, grab a free School of Motion account on our site so you can get the Motion Mondays newsletter. Currently, over 24,000 MoGraph artists get this bite-sized email each Monday, and it keeps you up to date on the doings of the motion design industry. So check that out. That's it for me. Thanks as always for listening. And don't worry, we'll be together again soon. See you later.